Misha here, and in my continuing look at Japanese warships, it's time to get to the big carriers, the so-called fleet carriers of World War II. And I started off looking at the Hosho, the original first aircraft carrier, which would later be classified as a light carrier because only could have about 15 planes on board. Also talked about the Ryuho, Ryuho, another light carrier made in the early 1930s to get around the Washington Treaty. So today we're going to talk about the Akagi and the Kaga. Now the Kaga here is in its original configuration with the three flight decks and the Akagi here is in its refit configuration with one long solid flight deck and this model is actually from De Agostini because I could not find the Eagle Moss Akagi but I did get the Kaga and this will be good to talk about the original configuration these are interesting ships because they're a direct result of the Washington Naval Treaty. Japan, who was a signator to the treaty, was way over the tonnage limits. They had been building up their naval force with the 8-8 plan. So they were going to have to scrap quite a few ships. And so they already were going to scrap the older ones. But they had several battleships and battle cruisers already laid down in the early 1920s and the treaty did allow for the conversion of two existing hulls battleship battle cruiser hulls into aircraft carriers as long as they were under 34,000 tons for research testing and development so Japan picked the two Agami class ships, which were battle cruisers. So you had Akagi and Agami to be turned into aircraft carriers. But in 1923, we had the Great Kanto earthquake, and while Akagi, the hull which had been started. 1920 was okay, damaged a bit, but okay. Amagi, her hull was just damaged beyond really salvaging at this point. It would have cost more money to salvage her than to start over. So Japan requested that they replace the Amagi battlecruiser hull with another one to continue making a carrier, and this was approved. So they picked Kaga which had also been started actually earlier in 1920 as a Toza class battle ship. So slightly different starting points even if the concepts were similar. So in 1923 both hulls were reclassified as carriers and construction and conversion would commence from that point forward. Alright, for this part of the video, Kaga can stand in for both Akagi and itself. <clears throat> so after the earthquake in 1923, work would begin on converting Akagi into a carrier at the end of that year. And she would initially be launched as a carrier in 1920 five and then be fitted out and officially commissioned in early 1927 although sea trials and testing would not be over until nearly the end of that year as for Akaga she would be officially selected for conversion but work would be halted in 1924 for a couple of reasons one money two to introduce perhaps new developments learned from Akagi's conversion so her 
position really didn't get going until 1925, meaning she was a little behind. She would, uh, she would be commissioned about a year after her semi-sistership in 1928 and undergo sea trials and, and all that. Akagi would join the fleet officially in 1928 and Kaga would join in 1929. And originally, both had this three flight deck arrangement. Both had a front deck that was about 180 and a half feet long. They had this dinky little secondary deck that was just over 49 feet long. And interestingly, the two main hangars opened directly onto these two front decks. So planes could come right out of the hangars and onto the flight decks. There's also a third hangar for reserve, putting in parts and whatnot. Kaga had a number one deck, a top deck, a little over 560 feet long. And Akagi, because she was on a slightly longer hull, being a battle cruiser instead of a battleship, had a top deck of over 620 feet long. And both of these were right at 100 feet wide. Interestingly, while Akagi was a longer ship, Kaga was a slightly wider ship. Again, kind of betraying their initial starting points. As a battleship, Kaga was expected to be about 26 and a half knots speed, but since she was lighter, by about 7,000 tons as a carrier. She actually had a top speed when initially built of about 27.5 knots. Akagi, on the other hand, was expected to have a speed of around 28.5 knots as a battle cruiser. And again, since she was about 7,000 tons lighter, she would end up being quite a bit faster at right over 32 knots. As built, Kaga would have a crew of about 1,350 and Akagi would have a crew of about 1,600. And both as built would have an air group of around 60 aircraft plus some in reserve either in part form or down in the auxiliary hangar. Unlike Hosho, these were armored. The flight decks were not, but at least they had an armored belt because, again, they started off as warships. And even more interestingly, they had guns. They were fitted with 7.9 inch guns and 5 to 5.5 inch guns plus 3 inch anti aircraft guns, multi purpose guns. Because at this time, in the late 20s, they really weren't sure what a carrier would do. Although Japan would be at the forefront of carrier operations, they still thought it would give a force multiplier effect to a battle group, would be tactical support to a battle group, battleship, battle cruiser. Therefore, they weren't sure that these might not engage in surface warfare at one point or another. So they had guns. Back to their air group and facilities. They had two elevators, but no catapults. Now, Kaga would be built using an arrestor system kind of borrowed from the French Baron class, whereas Akagi would be built using a system borrowed from the British Furious class, neither of which actually would last long, both of which would be replaced. Also, they were experimenting with what to do with the with the funnels, with the steam, the smoke, and whatnot from carriers on flat tops. So Akagi and Kaga would both be built with different funnel systems. As it happens, the one on Akagi was much better, so that would be the style adapted for, for later ships. But anyway, they were trying different things. They were still experimenting, just trying to see what worked. 
And so when both of these were joining the fleet, they had an air group of 60. And interestingly, Akagi would actually be captained by someone you probably never heard of, Admiral, at the time Captain, Yamamoto. He would uh, command Akagi from late 1928 through late 1929. I normally don't mention captains and stuff just because, but you ain't gonna mention that. So they would do fleet exercises and training. And uh, Akagi, being in service a little bit longer, would go in for a minor refit at the end of 1931. So she would miss the Shanghai incident in January, February of 1932, but Kaga would go along with Hosho over here, and actually there would be the first naval air victory in February of 1932, and she would support operations. And then returning to Japan to join her sister, and work on the ship. And by 32 and into 33, this three-flight deck arrangement system was already not great. The top deck was fine on both carriers, but the middle deck was useless, and even the front deck at under 200 feet was of nominal use, and they could tell the way aircraft development was going that, yeah, it wouldn't be useful for that much longer. The... I still think the concept of the planes flying right out of the hangar onto the deck is neat, but yeah. So with that, since Akagi was showing herself a little more capable, it was decided to send Kaga in first for a thorough reconstruction in 1933. And that's when this design here would end up looking like this over here. So yeah, quite a major reconstruction. Just so I say it right now, both of these were between 28,000 and 34,000 tons, depending on if they were light loaded or heavy loaded. Again, very similar ships in a lot of things, a lot of ways. Although, obviously, Akagi was a little faster than Kaga. On the other hand, early on, and really throughout their whole career, Kaga would end up supporting just a couple more aircraft because of her wider body and a little more space in the hull. You know how it goes. They're just kind of different conversions. But with these ships, they were really learning carrier tactics for the fleet and really proving to the Imperial Japanese the value of large fleet carriers, which would, of course, end up influencing the course of world history. So yeah, because Kaga was uh, slower and had a smaller primary flight deck, she was put in first in 1933 for modernization using the lessons learned. Plus she had actually seen combat to some extent in China. And it was a big rebuild. They took the front two decks and plated them over making one giant top deck and turning what used to be deck space into hangar space many more planes could be stowed underneath the top deck was extended out to about 815 feet and actually the entire hull was extended out about 33 feet to make room for things. With all these changes they also added a third elevator and a new hydraulic arrestor system. This one made in Japan, developed in Japan. And they gave her funnels like those found on Akagi. She could now carry 72 aircraft ready to fly plus 18 more in reserve for a total of 90. They did away with these, frankly, useless 7.9 inch guns, giving her more small guns to be used either as dual purpose or anti-aircraft. And 
They also gave her a new power plant with new screws, increasing her top speed to just under 29 knots. They gave her more fuel storage, giving her longer range endurance, and her crew increased to around 1,700. All kinds of new things making her much more effective fighting ship. So when she returned to fleet service, it, towards the end of 1935, <clears throat> she looked like this here. And with Kaga's reconstruction complete, a Kagi was sent in in November of 1935. Now, the work needed to do on a Kagi was less than Kaga because they didn't have to do things like put in new funnels and they didn't have to lengthen the hull. However, because of budget constraints and other factors, it actually took longer, quite a bit longer, to complete her conversion. Her flight decks would be paved over to, plated over to, giving her a longer top deck. It was actually just a tiny bit longer still than the one on Kaga, but we're just talking a, a number of feet. On the other hand, she actually carried 86 total aircraft, but more than that, only 61 were made ready with 25 in reserve. So, on an aircraft sense, perhaps Kaga was still a little more capable. On the other hand, Akagi was still faster, but interestingly, whereas Kaga would gain speed during the reconstruction, Akagi would lose it just a little bit, dropping down to a bit over 31 knots. So still comfortably faster, but going from over 32 knots down to just over 31, she lost over a knot in speed. They also added, and this is something specific to Akagi, a, uh, a superstructure, an island, on the port side, which is a very weird thing for aircraft carriers. Uh, most of your Japanese carriers would either have no island at all, well, pretty much have no island at all, frankly. She, too, would get the uh, third elevator and the new hydraulic arrestor system so she could operate newer planes. But it would not be toward, until the yeah, more or less end of 1938 that she was finally done with her reconstruction and would rejoin the fleet. And with this rebuild, Japan would have two of the most modern carriers in the world and would quickly start working with and training them and both carriers would receive new airplanes, more modern. They would get some of the last biplanes at this time and some of the earliest monoplanes. And this would pretty much be the configuration they would be in when uh, they would go to Pearl Harbor. Now, it's worth pointing out too, the overall tonnage would increase between 38,000 and 42,000 just depending on how fully loaded they were so we're beginning to be quite quite heavy at this point but by this time the Washington Naval Treaty had expired anyway Japan had walked out of the London Naval Treaty so it doesn't really matter they have a free hand to do what they want by 1938 and so to some extent unfortunately that's exactly what they did the second Sino-Japanese War would begin in July of 1937 and Kaga would be sent that August to support operations kind of providing close air support for army advancement also sending uh, bombing missions into nationalist held areas they would actually have their first uh, air to air victory on the 13th but then they would have Quite a few of their bombers shot down 
because they weren't escorted just a couple of days later, getting their nose bloodied a bit. They would be joined by Hosho and Ryuho during that operation, but uh, not Akagi because she was still finishing up her reconstruction. The uh, Kaga would stay on station until September, then she would go to Sasebo for resupply, and then return in October. And actually she would stay there for quite a long time, aside from sailing home just to resupply briefly. She would stay there until December of 1938, at which time she would finally be relieved and sent back to Japan, because finally Akagi was ready, and she would uh, take Kaga's place beginning in January of 1939. Kaga, for her part, would return home and beginning at the end of 1939 undergo a reconstruction and rebuild using a lot of the lessons learned after the experience in China and this would last well into 1940. Meanwhile, Akagi would continue to support operations in central China in the 1940. And once Kaga was done with her kind of second rebuild, Akagi would go in to be redone. Again, using lessons. We're talking like rebuilding the bridge to make it more efficient trying to install new communications gear, some of the early basic radar, uh, new arrestor systems, more effective, and also be able to handle newer, larger aircraft. The monoplanes were in vogue now. This is when both carriers would start to fly the A5M Clod. And so uh, Akagi would come out of her little stay at Sasebo. And then on April 1st, 1941, the Japanese Navy would form the first carrier fleet. A very interesting and revolutionary tactic for that time in which they would combine all of their heavy, large fleet carriers into one attack group and they would combine all their aircraft into one big attack group with an overarching command. And then on April 10th, both Akagi and Kaga would be assigned to this new fleet. And Akagi would be made the flagship, a position that she would hold until her sinking. Now, don't get me wrong, the battleship was still preeminent. I mean, this is the country that made the, the Yamato. So they definitely still had a thing for battleships. But more and more, the carrier is earning respect. However, they did have some worry about, you know, putting your eggs all in one basket. So while the carriers would operate together, they would separate them by quite a bit of distance physically. And each one would have a certain level of independence with their own aircraft, even though they would be working together. And they would begin training as a unit, trying to bring things together in the summer of 1941. And again, using the lessons now both carriers learned during operations in China. It's also important to note that their pilots were experienced with carrier operations and, and dogfighting and bombing. So we have a well-seasoned carrier, well-seasoned pilots. The carriers had both been through two reconstructions plus other minor refits. I'm not saying every bug was worked out, but... The big ones were, which meant they felt they were ready for a true test. So beginning in September of 1941, both Akagi and Kaga, along with the other fleet carriers, well most of them at any rate, began training for what would become the attack on Pearl Harbor. Before talking about Pearl Harbor, which to be fair, what can I say, really, I wanted to mention the models. The Kaga 
is from Eagle Moss, circa 1932, and it is 1, 1,100 scale. And the Akagi is from De Agostini, circa 1942, and it is 1, 1,250 scale. Normally this would bug me, and it, it does bug me. But, getting the Kaga is hard enough from Eagle Moss. I actually ordered one from Aikens, only to get an apologetic call saying that they had an inventory miscount and they were out. Luckily, Flying Mule still had some, so I grabbed it there. But getting the Akagi, I cannot find any Eagle Moss Akagis, period. And even the D'Agostini Akagi is only at one place, as far as I'm aware. And that is uh, 1250ships.com. And from what the owner tells me, he pretty much got the entire batch that was brought in. And that's the thing, both of these are imports, they're not made for the American market. The D'Agostini were made for the German market, and the Eagle Moss were made exclusively for the Japanese market. So if with anything import, you get what you can get. Luckily, they scale pretty good together. Uh, Akagi should be a smidgen bigger than Kaga, instead it's a smidgen smaller. But, unless you have them next to other like this, it's okay. The Eagle Moss definitely weighs more. And it is a little bit better quality, but of course they cost more. I just feel lucky to have them. Because finding any of the fleet carriers in the Eagle Moss line is very difficult. At any rate, training began in September of 1941. Pilots would actually go ashore with their planes to practice the mission. They would take on supplies and ordnance, including torpedoes especially designed for running shallow for the bay of Hawaii. Practice, practice, practice. The six fleet carriers would assemble on the 22nd of November and then set sail for Hawaii on the 26th, kind of picking a circuitous route to keep them away from any major commercial traffic areas, trying to be unspotted as long as possible. And from there, I think you know the history, December 7th. Both, of course, launched aircraft. Both were loaded fully. Uh, Kaga had her full complement of 72 aircraft, plus 9 spares, so a total of 81 on board. And Akagi had 60 available, plus spares. And both would launch two waves. Both would take minor losses. Their dive and torpedo bombers would go after the battleships, where, where their A6Ms, which they now both had on board, if they didn't need to do any escort duties, would strafe the airfields and other structures. Both ships would target, or the aircraft from both ships would target and hit the USS California and Oklahoma, as well as Maryland. Kaga would go after the USS Arizona, as well as Nevada in West Virginia. Akagi would go after USS Pennsylvania. And a few other ships, like an oil tanker that was unfortunately nearby. And Akagi, her group would actually shoot down a B-17 that was flying in from the mainland and it was kind of unfortunate. The B-17 was able to kind of crash land and only one crew died, but yeah. And that's how the, uh, the war began. So, after the successful attack, the six fleet carriers hightailed it home, going straight back to Japan, and actually Hosho, amongst others, was there to kind of cover their disengagement. Can't really call it a retreat when it was, when it was a successful mission for them, but, yeah. That definitely showed the benefits of the first 
combined air fleet. Instead of carriers working independently, having an air group of 60 or 70 planes, when you combine six together, you had nearly 300 planes available. But, while well, this worked out, the downside to this arrangement would become painfully apparent just six months later at the Battle of Midway. Before Midway, though, the Japanese Navy and the first uh, carrier fleet continued to enjoy successes. Both of these supported invasions and landings and operations in January. And uh, leading into February. But uh, Kaga actually hit a reef and did some damage to her hull. They patched her up and so both were available when they launched a surprise attack on the Australian port of Darwin. That was to try to keep the Australians bottled up. It was a success. Uh, eight ships were sunk and others damaged, plus some damage to the city of Darwin itself. From there, they both went on to support the Second Battle of the Java Sea. But at this point, Kaga was sent back to Sasebo for permanent repairs to get the reef damage fixed up. And Akagi would go on. She would actually go into the Indian Ocean campaign trying to basically deflect and even uh, destroy the British Far East fleet. She would also take part on the raid on Colombo and help sink two British heavy cruisers and more importantly HMS Hermes, a British carrier, along with her escorts. So pretty active April. So for once Kaga was the one being rebuilt, and Akagi was the one out having combat. In May, both kind of went home. Akagi would be just, you know, she'd been fighting for five months, kind of be uh, re restored a bit, resupplied, had little things fixed. Kaga, fresh out of the dockyard, was ready to go. And so both would join two of the other major fleet carriers for a group of four for the planned invasion of the island of Midway. The other two fleet carriers were off doing other assignments. But four seemed to be enough. Yamamoto's plan was to invade Midway and draw the three American carriers that were operational at the time out and hopefully destroy them because if the US lost their carriers that was it they didn't have any working battleships to speak of they were pretty much using their carriers and fighting a defensive war for this first six months and to be fair the Japanese Navy was a little bit drunk with with success that had pretty light losses, a few draws, but no real solid defeats, even though the Americans and the British and the Australians and others put up a very valiant defense and definitely held their own. Still, in the spring of 42, it was going the way of the Japanese definitely more often than not. So with this in mind, they thought they would uh, trap the Americans, but of course, as we know, the Americans had broken their naval code and knew they were coming and laid a trap of their own. The idea for America, okay, they were outnumbered. They had three carriers, although poor Yorktown was barely patched up from a previous engagement. But they also had the island of Midway herself in her airfields. So that was kind of a ersatz carrier in and of itself. So it was seen as a four-on-four -four Brawl, and since America, since the Americans had the upper hand as far as intelligence, they thought they'd have a fighting chance. 
And so, beginning on June 4th, and to some extent lasting through June 5th, was the famous Battle of Midway that would uh, change the course of the war, and thus change the course, frankly, of uh, history. And both Kaga and Akagi would be there, but neither would leave there. Alright, home stretch now. As with Pearl Harbor, I'm not going to recount Midway today. This is already a long enough video. It's about the carriers and the models to some extent. It's a very interesting story if you haven't read about Midway. To put it very bluntly and succinctly, at the beginning, the first couple of hours, American attacks were ineffective, to say the least. Uh, a lot of brave Americans lost their lives, but they kept the Japanese distracted. And then, all of a sudden, around 10 a.m., the tide just dramatically shifted. And it really all began with the flight of 28 SBD dive bombers. And because of miscommunications, all of them went after Kaga. She was hit by three 500-pound bombs and one 1,000-pound bomb. One of the 500-pounders hit her bridge, pretty much wiping out most of her uh, flying officers. And the other three hit the flight deck, penetrated it, went into the hangar. You know the story. There was a bunch of uh, fuel and ordnance and everything else horribly explosive. And she went up in a huge fireball. Burning, burning, burning. Unfortunately, one of the major flaws to both the carriers, to really Japanese carriers in general, was their fire suppression systems and water pumps. Both were extremely ineffective, if even working at all. Many crew were trapped under the deck. Destroyers came alongside and took off the crew as best they could, but she wasn't long for this world, and she was shot by a torpedo from a Japanese destroyer to make sure that the Allies would not capture the Hulk. And uh, actually the most would be lost on Kaga. 811 sailors and aviators died. The worst uh, ratio of any carrier that day. Akagi almost got lucky. Of those 28 SBDs, all were going after Kaga, but at the last minute, literally, uh, one wing commander and his two wingmen veered off and went after Akagi. So, not having three, three planes. I mean, a any carrier should be able to shrug that off, unless they get extremely unlucky. Now, two of the three thousand pound bombs that this flight dropped were near misses. So they probably went, whew. But the third hit the deck, pretty much amidships, penetrated, and went into the hangar. And we had a repeat of the situation with all the fuel and ordnance. Not quite as bad at first, though, because only one bomb instead of, uh, instead of four total. But again, her fire suppression system failed. One thing... One of the near misses that they thought they were going to get away with actually hit close enough to the ship that it damaged her water pumps. And later, they soon figured out, it also damaged her rudder. So without a good way to fight the fire, she too became a burning hulk. Now she would actually stay afloat until that early evening, at which time her own captain ordered a destroyer to torpedo her and put her out of her misery. People still lost their lives, but it was only around 250, which is better than over 800. Nevertheless, Midway was an unqualified disaster for the Japanese Navy. And it it did it, it, it kind of bring true the whole eggs in one basket thing. It were the uh, 
offensive capability of the Japanese carrier style was awesome as soon as seen in Pearl Harbor. However, defensively, they were deficient. They did not have adequate cap patrols. The Japanese radios were known to be pretty crappy. Japanese radar was rudimentary at best, so early warning was virtually non-existent. And their fire suppression systems, unarmored decks, and just general way of doing things in waves and changing orders and things, it all combined that when the fleet went on the defense, by the way, their anti-aircraft guns were, were shite as well. So, and you can say that about the Japanese planes. They had very good offense, but their defense was pretty rubbish. Hence why in one day, in really one hour, the war in the Pacific totally flipped. As much as the loss of so many battleships and cruisers at Pearl Harbor hurt America, the loss of four of the six fleet cruisers at Midway devastated Japan. The thing is, the battleship, while a great sign of prestige, was World War I technology. World War II, the carrier, was the new technology. The U.S. lost outdated ships. Japan lost cutting-edge ships. And by losing her battleships, it forced America to use her carriers in ways she may not, might not have thought of otherwise. Plus, of course, it led to the Essex class, which was just... A crazy number of, of fleet carriers that America would start turning out. In other videos, I'll of course talk about the Japanese Navy in 1943, 1944, and even 1945. But, for all intents and purposes, as a serious offensive force, it ended in June of 1942. Of course, they did not know that, neither Japan or America. America thought they had a victory, but they did lose the Yorktown, and they were still reeling from Pearl Harbor. So the, the gravity, the, the weight of their victory, didn't start to become clear until late summer and early fall, when Japan switched tactics and America started to press its advantage after Guadalcanal and all that. But anyway, that's a story for another video. Appreciate you staying with me. I figured big carriers needs a big long video. Especially after the shorter ones we did. Appreciate you tuning in. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha. And I will catch you very soon. Next time.